Hi, my name is Roy Collin and welcome to the show. I've also got five podcasts, The Awakening Podcast, Exposing Fraud and Corruption, but with Solutions, the Crypto Podcast, talking about all things blockchain, NFTs, crypto, the Meditation Podcast, talking about all different types of meditation, but there's also meditations there from one minute to two hours. And the other one's the Learn Polish Podcast, so if you're interested in learning Polish, you can do that. And the other one is speaking with Roy Colin, and I just have guests from around the world talking about either public speaking or also about their book or just general life in general. And you find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. I'm also a podcasting coach. And you see the QR code there, and it's also on my link as well. And if you're interested in actually going on some podcast shows, I'm helping people doing that. Or if you're interested in sponsorship, you can contact me. And I'd like to thank my sponsor, DanielPacker.com. He helps people with anxiety, stress, and addictions. He's got a 90% success rate, and you only pay for successful. So be sure to check him out, DanielPacker.com. I hope you enjoy this week's show. Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on SpeakingPodcast.com. My guest today, combat veteran who served 11 years in the U.S. Army, Sarah Lantepenor, founding board member of a veteran nonprofit, and the author, Dam the Valley. Please welcome William Yeski. Good to be on. So I can see the, the book there, but... Uh, you might just let the listeners know a little bit more about you. I mean, I've just kind of mentioned bullet points. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, like you said, so the experience in the book is uh, about a, an experience that I had in 2009 to 2010, the majority of it being in 2010, but uh, in the Argandab River Valley of Afghanistan to where, I mean, things ramped up to the point to where we had a 52% casualty rate, which is unheard of in modern day deployments you take a group of what normally is an infantry company and i think they're supposed to be around 200 at strength you're never at full strength so i think we were sitting at about uh, 170 180 guys but if you take that number and you just cut it in half and you say hey half of you are getting purple hearts in one way or another whether it's losing an arm losing a leg um you know, and the various other battlefield injuries that you have that are seen, you know, that's not even to account for the PTSD that I'm, I'm sure a lot of the guys, anybody who has suffered a traumatic event or occurrence like that, especially extended, um, you're talking about massive, uh, repercussions the rest of their life, depending on how they view that experience and depending on the circle they have around them. So no, I mean, I definitely want to t touch on the book, but I want to find out a little bit more about you because I'm me. A, yeah, your your <laughs> your wife is in the military as well. So one, how you got into the military, and two, what's life like when your partner is also in the military? Yeah, so we both left around the same time. Uh, she left, I think it was a month prior from me. Um, you know, at least the active duty side. She was Air Force. So there, uh, it was a little bit of a, an interesting, you know, really by rest, they're like, wait, your army, air force, how did this happen? Um, but we, we met, you know, she was, uh, she was working on Pope air force base and I was in the area, um, you know, at Fort Bragg, but, um, you know, one thing led to another and, and here we are eight years later, <laughs> you know, great marriage and whatnot, but, um, I guess how I joined the military, um, I joined up a little later than most. I joined up at 26. Uh, I had always kind of felt that call and everything. And I was a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. Um, and I was sort of talked out of the military to begin with for my parents. Uh, they had said, hey, look, we think you should go to school first. And then from there, possibly join up as an officer. And really what I needed at the time was that discipline that the military instilled in order to, to put that stuff in place in school, because I think I was three years in and I was partying hard. I was doing the, you know, what, um, some of my friends would call the wild bill thing. And, um, you know, I mean, my grades were good and whatnot, but I just never showed up to class. It was always, always that end of things. So it just kind of, it kind of fell apart and I ended up, um, you know, doing some exciting stuff, more adventure things. I was with a BMW race team and they would race road tracks. So Lime Rock Park, Road Atlanta, um, Watkins Glen. And I was having a blast there. And the girl that I had met in college, she uh, she went a different path, you know, and I was heartbroken. 
and stuff. And I started to, I started to spiral and I was like, you know what? I always wanted to do the military and we're still at war and stuff. And we're losing good people out there. Like, why not, why not go yourself, see what it's about. It's something you always wanted to do. And, you know, don't let that chance pass you by. Um, and man, I'll tell you what, I got the full experience. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and how how long is the training once you decide, hey, I'm going to join the military? How long do they train you for? So let's see. So in March, um, I signed up in March or I left for for basic training in March. And there was a few delays and stuff in the uh, in the process. But really, I was signing into the unit that I went to on this deployment in December. So you have basic training and then you have airborne school is um you know, three weeks, four weeks of airborne school, really, there's, there's a little bit of holdover. So it's about a month. Um, but really, you don't need that much training to, to fall out of a plane. It's the follow on that when they start teaching you when you get to division, and they start strapping, uh, you know, <laughs> a 45 pound dry pack on you. So you have this, this massive rucksack sitting on the front of you. And you have to jump out of these planes with that on and do follow on missions afterwards. That's, that's when it really starts to to hit you that, okay, what am I into now? Because <laughs> the thing is, I mean, with lots of different qualifications and everything, the amount of years that they have to go through training. But I found, oh, like, yeah. say, the military and the police, I know you're training on the thing, but you're putting your life on the line. And it's, I don't think it's it's long enough. I mean, because you should be as top as you can get. But when they're kind of putting you out there, I think they're putting you at risk when they're they're kind of deploying people so early. Yeah, I mean you're not you're not wrong there. I mean that's even, you know, there's additional stuff. Um, like I went to a separate EMT class that they sent me to that was um was it four or five months. Uh, so I mean we got EMT qualified specifically in the what's trauma EMT area things. Ah, uh, sorry about that. Emergency medical training. So like um, classes with people that would be in ambulances, like those first responders. So they, they sent us to those. So really their thinking was to deal with the traumatic ends. And we would actually do rotations with the local hospital. Um, we had to do, you know, and, and get qualified on that end. So it's like, they'll teach you uh, what's called a CLS class, combat lifesaver. It's the bare basics. It's like, oh, someone's bleeding out and you throw a tourniquet on it and how you, how much you crank it down to where EMT they're getting into the chest seals and, um, they'll teach you the basics of, uh, giving IVs and sticking people, although they tell you like, oh, you're not supposed to, but I mean, <laughs> if you know what you're doing and you're in the situation where it calls for it, at least there's somebody who's been through it a few times. Um, and it's a little different when it's military as opposed to civilian trained, but no, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't think anything could ever prepare you fully for combat and you don't fully know how you're going to react until the situation happens in front of you. You're, you're never going to know until it really does. And all you can do is train for it until then. And really that's, that's the most important part because if once things kick off, you know, you go into that mode of where you don't have time to think about that. And the learning curve is gone at that point, you are just doing. So nothing can ever really prepare you, but, um, but when you get thrust into that position, you know, at that point, you better be ready. And so, like, I know you have two children. Did you ha have the children while you were both in service? That was actually one of the things that uh, led the decision to leave service. Um, me and my wife were dating at the time, and I had actually put in a, a packet to go to a, a different area within the military and to try out for this particular uh, unit. So when she came to me and she was like, Hey, um, I'm pregnant. We're going to have a kid. And I, we kind of talked about it and everything. And I was like, I made the decision to, you know, really to put an analogy to it, to jump out that door of the plane and, you know, leave my military service and jump into the family end of things. Um, just because of this particular unit, you can't, you can't have anything else you're thinking about. It's either one or the other. And I had to kind of make that decision. I'm like military life, family. I chose family overall. And I think honestly, 
um, down the road and everything, I, I think I made the right decision. Yeah, so it's hard now for me to even fathom that, but like when you're actually in the combat zone, what's going on in your head? Honestly, most, most times when all this stuff kicked off and all the different instances that we were involved in one, one in particular, um, someone threw a grenade over a wall at us and this thing hit a tree limb and bounced around the corner, which is the only reason nobody got killed during it, you know, and it just went into full on firefight, you know, their AKs were clacking our machine gunner that was on the roof was returning fire, but he was in a position to where he couldn't traverse the gun low enough to effectively fire back at these guys. So he stood up on the roof, shoulder firing this belt fed machine gun, uh, 240, 240 Bravo. So shooting seven, six, two linked and these rounds and he's standing up and he's, their fire is so close. He's hearing it whiz by him but he's getting splinters in the face from the trees and stuff that are below in the orchard. I mean, he thought he was done. He thought it was all over at this point. And he's just firing back into this and it, this full on commotion moment. And I had the radio at the time and I'm right below these, these gunners who are on the roof and right in front of the building. So I'm calling up that we're under fire, you know, and it's just one thing after another, they're getting stacked up and the squad leader, I'm yelling over to him. Hey, do we need, do we need extra people out here? Cause I'm online with the, with the CEO and he's like, we're good. And they flow right out. But afterwards, after everything was said and done, you know, that's when you take that, that pause and that after, and you kind of go through it. There's really, there's no time. And if you, and if there is time, something's wrong, you know, if you're hesitating, um, you need to check that because that more times than not, whenever people hesitate within a combat situation, that's when, that's when someone gets hurt. That's when someone gets killed. Um, it is just that that life to that far extreme. This is kind of a bit touchy you now, but like when when I look at say confessions of an economic hitman and John Perry, and he's kind of saying how many countries been infiltrated by the states and everything. And I mean, I know you're doing what you're kind of you're told to do, but hindsight, you know, going in. You know, whether people claim it's for democracy or whatever, but when you look at it, like, it's really big boys playing a game with people's lives, both sides of the fence, unfortunately. You know, and that is, that's some of the things that I came across in writing this and some of the things when I'm, when I was talking with the higher echelons is that, like, when I wrote this book, this book kind of was from the ground. This is the view from the guy's that were placed on the ground in there and the talk of like those struggles that you have in dealing with the populace when you're out there, because all you're really trying to do as a soldier, you're, you're trying to stay alive. You're trying to keep your buddies alive. But also the way we looked at it is we got, it was a little different. This wasn't an invasion. You know, we got embedded in with other Afghan police that was right off of one of the other major villages there. And our patrols would mainly you know, go through these villages, talk to these villagers, try to talk to them and provide, be like, Hey, what's happening? How can we provide you security? Not being that standoff person, um, that just wants to kill everything. You know, that's where the misconception comes. They're like, Oh, you know, infantry. And really we were thrust into what a, what would normally be a special forces job. And that's to like really assist the local populace and to assist their military and their police forces um, in providing the public security. And that's, that's something we did. I mean, in a way of to where when we first got there, people didn't want to talk to us, you know, and the people hated us. And really that's be because of the people that were there before us, they got so skittish to the point to where um, they weren't even go out and on patrol at that point. And they were, um, just in that mindset of everybody's the enemy kind of, you know, that's not the, that's not the way to be. And so it took us about, it took us a little while to get them to start opening up and talking to us. But when we finally started talking to these villagers and they started realizing like, Hey, these, these guys are different. They have a different motivation behind them. And really, um, 
you know, to be at, at one point to be brought in and said, Hey, look, uh, we want you to be able to stay, stay in the village tonight, stay in the mosque. And they put, and I was, that was something that just blew us away. Like, because that's not normally um, something you would get. That's their sacred place and stuff. And we, we actually declined that, but we were like, no, absolutely. Because these people were tired of getting pulled out of their houses in the middle of the night, you know, and either be beat up, threatened. Some of them, um, you know, uh, would just get ripped out. They didn't know if they were going to die or not in the middle of the night. They just, there's no security. And to have that over your head all the time. And then to just offer that, hey, you know what? What's the least we can give you? Maybe a good night's rest. Um, but as far as that end of those upper echelons and, and working through um, changing over a country and stuff like that, or working through a conflict like that, I didn't really touch on that. I boiled this thing down to that small level, but really the the generals and stuff I talked to, one of the biggest things was we got into this thing and we didn't really have a plan to get out of it. There was no ultimate plan forward and we never worked our way out of a job, which is really what we should be doing. If you If you go into somewhere, you should be assisting the people, not... Um, you're there for them. You're there for humanity. You're supposed to be there as a protector, not as, you know, a destroyer unless necessary. And I can, I can imagine what it must be like for the locals, especially children. Is, is the whole country under fire or is it only certain regions? So that, that particular one was a hot spot. If you looked at where it was in the, uh, corridor leading into Kandahar, and this is actually how we ended up there, was that they had a lot of stuff free flowing in and out of Kandahar, and and people, you know, really that's what it was is free freedom of movement. You know, all these guys would do is they just dig stuff in the ground. They might bring it so far, and then they dig it, they place it in, they put a cache in, and they mark it, and then those next people come up and they take it and they move it through. There's that's really no cache. stopping. So a, a pile of weapons, munitions, just depends, just a cache of, of whatever. Like, um, so one, one particular one that they had dug in, we came up on um, during a patrol and these guys were shaving themselves in order to prepare themselves to blow themselves up as a suicide bomber. They had vests there and they had all the explosives and whatnot and the detonators, but this stuff was hidden up like in the hole of a tree. And it was like just the craziest, like, so here's like 50 plus detonators and it actually affected the um, op tempo in the area, the amount of landmines and stuff that we were finding or hitting actually slowed down quite a bit um, just due to this fine. But yeah, they would just place things either in wells or, you know, you'd be going through an orchard and just find this little dugout and there'd be <laughs> weapons or munitions uh, just waiting for somebody or a team to pick them up and in place them, you know, in order to do harm. Like, have you kind of captured any of the guys that were attempted to be suicide bombers? Because I'd love to get into their head because, I mean, I've come across plenty of people in cults and you kind of understand how they're brainwashed into it. But being in a cult and actually, you know, committing suicide for, you know, what they believe in. They're... <sighs> There's two sides of that. And we saw everything from like, so those particular guys, they, of course, they grabbed up some AKs on the, that were on the ground um, that were next to them and started shooting at us. Um, you know, which of course we went into react to contact and, and uh, they got away. You know, we didn't actually end up getting them, but we ended up pulling these, you know, all this uh, bomb material out and stuff. But we did end up, um, pulling in a few guys to where uh, there was three of them and we held them. And after we brought them in, they had been living within the village and we brought these guys in and we, we held them there waiting for uh, Afghan police authority and stuff to come pick them up and bring them to prison and whatnot. But the, a whole bunch of the village came out and signed affidavits that these people were Taliban you know, and it was just the fact of like, everybody was terrified to speak up about it. Um, and they were letting these guys operate right under our noses. But 
as far as the mind of a suicide bomber, you know, I wasn't here for this one, but the guys, um, the story that was going around was they came across a child that he was trying to hit a button. He was trying to hit a detonator. And this is this small child. I mean, like 10 year old that they put a vest on and he's weak and stuff, but they told him that, you know, if he went up to the Americans and hit this, that he would go straight to heaven and to have that sort of twisted mentality. Like, I don't think that that's anything that, um, really has a place out there. You know, I mean, that's, that's straight evil, you know, going against something like that, you know, I, I can understand. And I actually, you know, on one end, I would love to talk to you, you know, not in any sort of angry way or whatnot, but love to talk to some of the combatants and the people we faced over there, like sort of in a warrior to warrior capacity, because I respect that. I mean, I respected the fact that, um, you know, that's terrifying. You know, you have these guys that are in, a third world country in the middle of nowhere, you know, with uh, fighting a, a modern day conventional army force with huge amounts of resources behind it. Um, and, you know, quite essentially the insurgents, you know, it's like the rebellion. Um, and to look at it in the way of, you know, yeah, exactly. Like place yourself in their shoes and look at it. Like, what are they seeing? Why are they fighting you? Uh, are they fighting you um, to protect their families, which they weren't. A lot of these guys that we would have come across were actually foreign foreign fighters, you know, on a jihad. So we would run them through a biometric system and stuff afterwards, and we'd catch anything from Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, like where these people had been sighted and seen before due to fingerprints or retinal scan. And this is just through different techniques. That... Is this a financial thing? Because like I've seen that in a few different situations like i mean are these people fighting because they're getting paid to go into the different places to fight i know they're putting their life oh, at risk definitely oh definitely i mean so who's paying them? even i mean who's who's actually funding this because it looks like when you start digging holes when you start taking off a few layers it, yeah. it looks it looks like it's the same people that are doing it's you know, crazy yeah. you know and if you think about it it is if if you back up and follow the money and you start looking at it that way um is this just something to perpetuate the war machine? You know, it's, it, it's entirely possible. You, I, I have no idea. Um, but I definitely know that, you know, money is a major motivator. That's that grenade incident, um, that the compound that it was tossed from, uh, after they went into it and, um, the, the locals that had been living there were in there. Uh, and they had found a big stack of Taliban money. They had been paid off, you know, to, hey, we're going to stay in here. We're going to shoot at the Americans when they when they come in and we're going to throw in here some money. You know, thanks for letting us stay here. And it's. The old man was terrified, you know, and quite honestly. Um, in that type of high stress situation, when they went in to clear this house after being shot at and almost blown up with a grenade. Um, they did the right thing. You know, I mean, here's this guy in the house and I'm, I'm so surprised because he went to come out of the door as they were coming in, you know, and he just got taken to the ground instead of, instead of shot up. Most people would have pulled the trigger on that one just because it was just right there. And to be able to have that, um, I guess, discipline, you know, and training to recognize that he was no longer, you know, he was not the threat. Uh, and the threat had disappeared, but, but yeah, they went through and they, in going through everything, they just found this huge stack of money and it was like, what is this? Well, you know, and they admit to it, they know. Um, but at the same time, what choice do they have? With the weapons that you recover, I mean, Lockheed and Martin and Raytheon, I believe are the big providers in the States. Who's actually giving them the weapons? Where are the weapons coming from? That's all stuff I, I never, I wouldn't be able to, I'm not the guy to talk to about that. You know, I'm not sure. Because I keep saying, I was follow the money and you find out who's actually pulling the strings like in this, you know, because there's somebody yeah. providing them with, with, with the weapons to, you know. Oh, they literally in, um, 
so in the special operations schoolhouse, they have economists, they have like literal doctorate degree economists that that's their job. They look at countries, economies, and they look at where the money's flowing. They look at the corruption levels and stuff. Um, and they come up with these situations and they, they game a whole bunch of stuff and they kind of put culture into it and whatnot, but they're constantly looking at these situations and looking at, um, you know, that that's one of the things, follow the money. You know, you want to find the source of the conflict, follow the money. And when you start using um, some of the programs they have and some of the things to find out connections and networking and, and where the pieces all fit in the pie, it's crazy when you start seeing these clear lines of corruption money and like where stuff is flowing. And it's just wild. So with the book, I, I haven't read it, but I've I've looked online and I know it's only recently released, but it's like it's got nine five star reviews, nothing less. And there's like some beautiful <laughs> comments, like, the, you know, really, really decent reviews. You know, they're not just kind of a one liner. Like so when somebody goes to the, you know, the trouble of actually writing something decent, it means it really touched them. And I heard you on another show that there was people that were reading it and they were getting they felt the smells. I'd love you to, to touch on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So there's, I, I really got the guys involved with this thing because I, I wanted to make sure there was another book that came out and it kind of challenged a few of the things that the guys had, had thought, um, thought about. And they're like, Hey, this didn't happen like that, or this wasn't the case. And it got a lot of them talking and I'm like, well, if that's the case, like, let's put something together that's historically accurate and like, let's make sure it's going to be a pain in the butt. But like, let's do it. Let's talk. Let's go back and forth. Let's triangulate these situations. And that's sort of like within this book, um, getting those accuracies in there, but then also putting it in such a way to where it's written at a high school level and it's written at a high school level for a reason. It's supposed to be an easy read, but it's also supposed to be for anybody to pick up and kind of understand that's, this is what these soldiers go through. Um, and like really somebody who's considering maybe joining up, you know, or someone that's about to be thrust into a wartime situation. It's, it's really a good, it's a good read on that end. It's just simple, but getting these guys involved in it was one of the most rewarding things out of the whole project, because number one, you're, you're talking with some of your old friends um, about some of the best of, and some of the worst of times. But um, when you boil it down like that, and when you get it to where, I mean, I've, I've had more recent calls from guys saying that they, you know, they broke down in tears at one point um, when they remembered certain things and like, man, I had totally forgotten. I had blocked this stuff out in the past. And, you know, as they're reading this thing and they're, I'm getting this feedback of they're actually getting olfactory senses and they're smelling things from the battlefield, not things in their house. They're smelling things that were on the battlefield or they're having cravings for cigarettes and they haven't smoked for, you know, five, 10 years. Um, that end shows that that picture was vividly painted, at least for somebody who was there before, you know, uh, I can't speak for everybody. I know some civilians and stuff have jumped on there. Cause I know one of the reviews is from someone, um, that we know from, from my daughter's, uh, scouts meetings. Um, there was a parent down there and I saw you had a book and like, and then they read it and I'm like, Oh God, like, <laughs> you know, um, but no, they had, a, they had a lot of good things to say about it. And, you know, a, again, a lot of these copies, I sent out a lot of advanced PDFs, like the, most of the guys and tried to get all of the guys, uh, copies. I'm not in touch with everybody, but, um, got these guys, the copies of the book, you know, and we had been bouncing stuff back and forth, but. I would keep it to like these particular ones so that they didn't have a full picture of the whole thing, but the incidences they were involved in. Um, but when you expand on it and it becomes the whole book, uh, they read through this whole timeline. That was one of my things in doing this. The timeline was very jumpy. So when we had to put it into, um, kind of a flowing on where that happened and stuff. And they're reading through this and it's all starting to flood back. Just, I was a little worried about some of those effects. Um, but now that 
now that I am having them read it or, you know, one of the guys read it in one night and um, one of the guys that was there and was just like, call me five in the morning, you know, and I, I freaked out. I honestly, I didn't know why I was getting this call from this person. Anybody that I was with back then, I have them on something to where even if my phone's on, do not disturb, it still rings. And I was worried. I was like, oh, oh man, like with hearing that, some of these effects that the guys had uh, that were clearly linking these traumatic events that they went through um, to what they were experiencing and reading in the book. And it was bringing this stuff back. I, I kind of had these fears of like, you know, um, why am I getting this call? So I, I pick up, you know, he's like, oh, wow, I just meant to leave a message. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I was, uh, I was actually just about to start working out. Uh, but you know, what's going on? And he just, he just broke down. He started, he was like super appreciative of everything. And I, um, we talked for, you know, my workout for the day was out the window, but we talked for over an hour and it was just like, it was like old times. It was like, um, just catching back up with an old friend. So with some of that opening up that trauma, um, come some good and these guys the ones that did share and the ones that have shared and are continuing to share it almost seems to be like a therapeutic thing for them and i know writing the book was for me um it kind of slowed me down enough to to really take in everything that actually happened over there as opposed to i mean you've seen some of the i guess some of the accolades that are out there of you know I, finished business school in two and a half years. And then I went on to do some stuff in the Ivy league and I just finished up with, with Columbia business school, um, you know, started the business. And really a lot of that has been going full speed, um, almost running away from some of this. So to be able to slow down and realize that and realize, Hey, you have some things that you still have to work on. Um, but it's been good. It really has been good. And I saw as well that you had to get it kind of like approved by the Department of Defense. So yes. what, what was the process? I, I understand it because obviously you can't be, <laughs> you know, giving away trade secrets. But what yeah. was it like for you to kind of get, I presume it was like when you get a, your mortgage letter kind of documentation back and it's all blacked yep. out like. Yes. Yes, it was. And it, that was wild to have come back. And I was just like, man. And a lot of that had to do with that we worked a bunch with special operations within in there. Like we ran a lot of outer court on QRF and um, we ran some stuff with them out there. They were, they were definitely active in our area. We would, a lot of the stuff we built targeting packages and stuff for uh, higher echelons that would come in and take care of the rest of it. But um, that the process wasn't that bad and everybody says it's painful and maybe I just got lucky. Um, because they had it approved within three months. Uh, you know, I mean, I just sent, sent everything in, went through the channels. There's a, there's basically a framework rundown, uh, on the DOD side of things when you submit manuscripts. And I mean, I got word back, um, they opened up my case and, you know, I sent it in and three months later I had it back, you know, with the black lines and stuff, but after getting it back so quickly, I kind of reached out and I was like, Hey, what's, what's your former background? And the guy came on there and he's like, well, I was infantry. And he's like, I really like this book. So we kind of pushed you to the front. <laughs> so it was, um, we got lucky. I, there's, just, there's, there's so many instances within writing this thing and within, uh, putting it together to where I don't know if it's the universe, just kind of moving it forward where it's like, Hey, people need to hear this story. I can't explain it any other way because I, honest to God, I am, it's my first, first actual book out on the market. I've written some other stuff before, but um, for this to go on the path that it has, and then also to be accepted in the Library of Congress. And now uh, my local library has a copy and, you know, I, I just got word that the New York Times has taken a look at it as well. So, I mean, to do that, and to be able to jump through these hoops, if I, if I can do that, you know, as somebody who is a lower enlisted on the ground, um, 
man, just the potential out there in some of these guys and using, using the discipline that was instilled behind them in the military in order to whether, uh, put it into a business end or another venture or your kids or really anything you do in life. Um, those routines and sticking, sticking to the, to the plan, you know, and adjusting as needed, um, all stuff that you learn in the military, if you learn how to translate it over correctly, you you've really been set up for, for success. You just need to realize it. I'd love to know your thoughts on when the Americans did pull out of Afghanistan and left all the weaponry behind what was going on in your head and your mates heads as well, when you saw something like that. So a lot of, a lot of guys look at that. And I mean, I hear everything. I hear it all from, we should have never been there in the first place to man, what a giant, uh, giant cluster. Um, at my level, you know, really all I can say is that it's clear, it's clear it wasn't properly planned. It's clear there was not a proper handoff. Uh, I mean, to have that country run through within days, you know, after we left. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crumbling as we're leaving. You know, you're seeing these videos of of people trying to get on planes and Afghan refugees, and you know, you have. Americans that reached out and are and are doing stuff on their own, even you know, forming um, uh, forming nonprofits such as uh, there's one out there, Save Our Allies, that they're out there trying to get these people out that assisted Americans. You know, there was interpreters. There's actually one of them, uh, Johnny, that they got out, and he was one of our old interpreters within. Uh, so he was with, I think he was with Second Platoon. Um, I was with First. But all these guys operated together. And I mean, I, I know, I know Johnny, I know uh, one of our other interpreters, Gucci, um, great people, you know, just a great human being. And to leave behind people that either we made promises to, or that assisted us putting their own life on the line, and then just, all right, well, sorry, didn't work out. Um, that's, doesn't fall right on anybody. I mean, that's just not the way to be. And as far as that end, that's where I think America kind of needs to reevaluate and say, you know, what are we doing here? What is the mission? What's your ultimate goal? And like, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, and what's, what are these people trying to accomplish? What is, what's best for them? It's quite honestly, uh, I mean, what I don't, know how bad the situation was before we even I, I mean we we went into there you know and they're still recovering from russian conflict era stuff which is why you had uh, al-qaeda and these uh different bad actors taking advantage of a place's training grounds so i mean you already have a corrupt country but like what do they have what is it like now you know you hear about it's it's worse it's even worse than than it was before we even got there. So, um, you know, really it's about going in with a plan, you know, and it's uh, even speaking with some of the generals and stuff too. They, that's one of their things is like, we went in there and you told me to, um, I think Petraeus actually said it recently in an interview, he was told, you know, well, what are we doing after? And they were like, just get us there. Just get us to this point in the mission stuff. And if you operate like that, like just one step at a time and not looking at that ultimate goal, you're just going to perpetually put yourself in it or you're going to fail. I hear a lot of kind of vets suffering from PTSD and it's usually veterans create the nonprofits or helping them. And I know you're involved in something like that as well, that you're helping. Is it the government kind of says, here, off you go, fight, and you come back and they wash their hands? Are they offering any support for people that have been seeing traumatic kind of things while on duty? Yeah, they've so they've come a long way with that that stuff. Um, I know they were sort of, as I was leaving active duty, um, they had a lot more programs that they were focusing on with that. So there was a lot more. Matter of fact, I... Um, I kind of assisted, I have my own story where I assisted this guy and this is, this isn't even in the book. This is much later, but he looked as if just something was wrong. 
something wasn't right. Uh, he was about, I think it was two weeks from leaving the service and being separated from the service. And most guys, when that's happening, they got a big grin on their face. And this guy was just moping around. And I'm just like, hey, what, what's going on, man? Like, you all right? Oh, no, I'm, I'm fine, Sergeant. And I'm like, no, man. Like, hey, nobody else is here. Come back to my office. And I just sat down with him for a little bit. And he started pouring his guts out. And he just, he didn't know. He didn't know how to deal with life, really. It was coming crashing down on him. And it was a lot of these things just stacked up. These guys can handle a lot of stuff. They're asked a lot, a lot of. But when you start piling on thing after thing after thing, I mean, there's a huge focus these days in mental health as it is. But when you pile on that other, that last weight, and a lot of us take on a lot of weight, um, sometimes it can be too much. And that's, he was at his snapping point. And when he went to me, he said, you know, he's like, well, I'm out in two weeks. I haven't done anything to get out. And that's because I'm, you know, um, thinking about going and just killing myself. You know, that's what's all this for. And I looked at him and I was like, well, what do you want? And he's just like, I don't know. I'm like, okay, what's, what's the ultimate, what would be your ultimate goal? And we talked for a bit and I'm like, all right, I'm like, I'll, I'll help you through this, but you got to trust me on this. And I went to the first sergeant and believe it or not, the first sergeant actually was zero help at all. Um, he actually told me to get this guy out processed out quicker than, you know, he's like, I don't want him to be a problem. I'm like, you freaking kidding me. Like, this is the, this is, this is your job. This is ultimately like your thing. This is keeping your guys alive. This is taking care of your people. So I also kind of had to put myself under fire and I was like, okay, that's cool. So I went back to the kid and I'm like, Hey, walk with me, man. We're going to go see Sergeant Major. <laughs> they just jumped, jumped the next run. And we went down and we got him down to the clinic, you know, and I basically stayed with him um, as well as I was a platoon sergeant at the time. So I not only now had my own platoon and this kid wasn't even mine, but I now had, you know, I was uh, given this guy now because he was the problem and I brought it up um, to take care of him and get him out processed the right way. I was like, okay, fine. I'm like, all right. But we, we got him out processed, but we got him the mental health that he needed. The, the issues were taken care of. Um, at least he started seeing clinicians and everything. I mean, but ultimately it was somebody just sitting down and talking with, and I think that a lot of the problems that are within the military on that end are also problems that stem within our society. We're so disconnected these days to where we can't even recognize, you know, when, when somebody's going through something, they got their, you know, you see it all the time. They got their, uh, their face down in their phone, as opposed to looking you straight in the eyes or, you know, looking around as they walk that attention and that focus is, is elsewhere. And it's not about, they're not present in their life. And I think that's one of the, one of the biggest issues. It's not just military. I think it's just amplified throughout military service members. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, William, I totally enjoyed the conversation, but what I'd love is to get you back in uh, Q1 of 2024. And what I'll do is I'll have like a questionnaire on the episode when it goes out. So those that have listened to it can have questions for when you come back. And also those that read the book might have some questions great. as well. So you, you might uh, let people know where they can find you. Yeah. So the uh, there's an official website at damnthevalleybook.com. And from there, you can kind of see, uh, you can get the book on, you know, you can either get a signed copy from there which helps me enable for every two signed copies that I sell, I am able to get one copy out to the guys that were actually there in the story. That's kind of my way of, of giving back through this. That's the only reason there's, there's author signed copies that are uh, up for sale on, on the web. Um, but I mean, you can go to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org um, as well. And check out the social media campaigns. Cause like in writing this thing, everything about it, um, I wanted to kind of provide people with the best possible picture and the most value from a book. So, I mean, it's not just a book, every single picture that's up there. Well, most of, not all of, but 
all the all the pictures that I post up there on the regular, the daily ones, are all pictures actually from that deployment and that were submitted from the guys that were on there. So you have almost a year's worth of pictures of these regions and the stuff that we did. Um, cause I'm really trying to give people that picture of what we went through and the, the most value that they can possibly get, uh, from this book. I'm just trying to give back here. Love it. So Love damn it. the valley book.com. <laughs> no, I'll make sure I put the link spot on the audio on the video. Thank you very much. Will. Right. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. No problem. So that's all for the speaking podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speaking podcast.com on next week. Take care. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five-star rating, and share with your friends. And you'll find all my shows with the QR code or bio.link forward slash podcaster, as well as my podcast coaching. And I'd like to thank my sponsor, danielpacker.com, helping people with anxiety, stress, and addictions. He's got a 90% success rate, and you only pay if you're successful. Also, if you'd like to go on a podcasting tour, I can help you do that. And if you're interested in sponsorship, you can contact me on my bio.link forward slash podcaster. Until next week, take care.